Just wait until I climb into the pipe and go all the way back to the restaurant. <laughs> I don't want to wait. <laughs> Dude, I'd be getting stuck in the pipe. They're going to have to set... <laughs> They're going to have to send the whole team down to get me. <laughs> What is up, everybody? This is Michael Sakan. I'm joined by my co-founder and co-host, Simran Sandhu, and you're listening to Our Future Podcast. This is the go-to entrepreneurship show for young people. Simi and I cover the hottest startups being built by people in their early, mid, late 20s who are going against the grain, who are young and taking big swings. And we kind of share the insights and the business strategies that they're using, and then share those with you guys so you can apply them to your own ventures. Now, why should you be listening to me and Simi? We know a thing or two about entrepreneurship. We sold our media company to Morning Brew in 2023. And now we get to host this awesome show to uh, further the entrepreneurship insights for Gen Z. So we have a crazy lineup of stories today. For some reason, uh, the companies we're covering today are both disrupting DoorDash in some way. And they're both going about it in a super smart strategy. So they're going after Behemoth and uh, they're changing the restaurant and delivery categories. So why don't you hit us with the first story, Simi? I'm super pumped for this one. Yeah, dude. And I will say DoorDash needs to be disrupted. I spent <laughs> so much money on their platform. And still, so like, you would think they would treat a good customer like me way better. I feel like the deliveries <laughs> never show up. For some reason, I'm paying so much money in fees. And yeah, they, we should be shareholders. It's, it's time. We should be shareholders in DoorDash. You know, what I think <laughs> the reason all these VCs and startup founders are going after the disruption of DoorDash is because like we need that shit when we're grinding and building companies. I need my chow mein to be delivered on pat. You know what I mean? True. So that's that's why True. we want it. Yeah. So for our first story today, we got these two guys, Adam Guild and Dean Blumbergen, and they've raised over $60 million for their company owner.com from people like Jack Altman and Naval. But essentially, they're helping restaurants grow their online sales and save thousands of dollars in fees. Because if you think about it, there's two challenges that restaurants face. One is, you know, they have to compete with these big national chains, think like Domino's and uh, you know, Papa John's who are spending billions of dollars in marketing and technology. And then, you know, they're also having to spend thousands of dollars in delivery fees yeah. uh, to companies like DoorDash and Uber Eats who are charging over 30% in every transaction. And so yeah. think of this platform like Shopify meets HubSpot, where essentially they help you build out your, you know, your website, they help you build out these marketing and, um, ultimately these automated campaigns across uh, email and SMS, and they help you build out a mobile app. And so, you know, they have this cool delivery feature as well, where they essentially charge you a flat fee, which I believe is $4 to the restaurant and $3 to the actual customer. So no longer do you have to pay the 30%. And they have thousands of restaurants already using the platform they're doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue and i think they're positioned to grow like crazy i mean yeah i think when jack altman announced the his fundraise into it or his investment yeah. into it, he was like we just had to throw more cash at this like it was just growing so fast it was so successful what i like and what he's done is for one the narrative and that he's representing the small guy right the totally you no know, daddy uh don's pizza restaurant right in, in the bronx or something and you know these are blue collar people who work really hard and happen to operate in one of the lowest margin businesses in the entire world which is restaurants so you know you'd think that there was so much technology built for restaurants over the past you know uh 10 years right Where, from the toast point of sale system to square uh to help them with credit card processing fees uh all the way to the delivery apps but there seems to have been a missing piece and really helping these restaurants, you know, weather the tough economic conditions that require, you know, a retail restaurant business. So um, it's interesting. It's a $500 subscription software and it's all in one, right? So it's a, a pretty meaty uh, subscription. You, know, you don't typically see software get up to like $500 per user, but it really is all in one. You know, it's got that Shopify dashboard. It's got uh, SEO uh, capabilities to help you rank on Google. Uh, it's got online ordering kind of user interface for the consumer to go through your website and some kind of loyalty stuff built in. They're even creating their own network of delivery drivers to help you kind of create your own white labeled delivery service through them, right? So 
I don't know, man. I think a good theme for this episode is dis. I feel like disintermediation is the trend of the 2020s. I would look out for startups that are looking to cut out the middleman, right? Because in the 2010s, the middleman was all the hot thing. You wanted to build that platform that connected businesses to consumers, right? And now we're seeing almost a revolution against that because of the fees and because of the economic power of these gig economy businesses in the middle. Um, Aren't they playing that intermediation role though? I mean, now they're connecting, you know, restaurants and users. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. You know, the, the great Dark Knight quote. And that's exactly yeah. what I think that the DoorDashes of the world have got, become. Well, yeah, totally. And I think when you think about it, it's integrated into an all-in-one solution. I feel like that's the theme over the 31 episodes that we've now had, which is you essentially want to replace their entire tech stack if possible and just try to bring one solution where it's like, hey, this is seamless, this is easy to use, and you get everything you need from here. Yeah. The tough thing is, is that, you know, it's it's tough, but it's also why there's opportunity here, which is that restaurants are just, you know, this entire industry is extremely fragmented, right? That's, it's like, you know, millions of mom and pop shops all across the country. They're all kind of doing their own thing. Um, most of them just kind of operate like based on like vibes and what they think makes sense. Like there's not a particular rhyme or reason. Right. Um, and so that's why I think this is a really compelling opportunity, which is like if they can become the de facto way that not only that they start these businesses, but like they're actually using to scale them out across every part of the value chain here. So um, I think this can be really cool. The way that I think about this is kind of like, you know, Shopify and Klaviyo, they've kind of merged it together, yeah, right? Yeah. Like if you think Shopify and Klaviyo with, the the website but also the uh automated campaigns of sorts and integrating it together for e-commerce that's what they're trying to do with their platform for the restaurant industry yeah they have sms and email capabilities that reminded me a lot of clavio but yeah dude just come you gotta think about the industry you're serving uh, if you're serving like restaurant owners you don't want they can't use lots of software but i'll use another example in uh shopify store owners you know how many software platforms these e-commerce businesses use like we've seen such a massive proliferation of software companies recently. This goes back to what we were saying earlier in that like concentration in software is becoming kind of where everyone's going, right? It's a integration, right? Across the entire stack because everyone just has like a million subscriptions and all these different tools that are trying to speak to each other. It's complicated, right? Yeah, you're so, getting nickel and dimed across yeah. the board and you don't even realize it. Yeah, you yeah. are, you know? And it's interesting that the Shopify ecosystem, the apps ecosystem has, has taken a hit recently because now Shopify is actually taking what they're seeing in the market that's working independently and just integrating <laughs> it into Making their, their platform, own, yeah. Right? They're dipping yeah. into their own cookie jar and like, you know, that, that's probably what makes sense because it's what their users would want. Amazon does it too, right? Like they follow yeah. the hottest purchasing, you know, they follow the hottest items on their platform. And it's like, okay, before you know it now, here's like the Amazon brand that comes out just to compete with the top players on the platform. It's, yeah. a, it's a funny <laughs> thing. Yeah. So my friend, a great mentor of mine and a early podcast guest on the Our Future ecosystem, his name's Socrates Rosenfeld, which first off is just like fucking sick. Like his name's Socrates Rosenfeld. Great name. And the story is even wilder. So Sock joined West Point after graduating high school and was just like absolute beast of a student. I mean, you can only get into West Point if you're like a genius. Then from West Point, he goes into the army and is a uh, Apache helicopter commander uh, in the Iraq war. So he served multiple tours, comes back, goes to MIT business school, then goes to work at McKinsey. And he kind of hates his life at McKinsey's kind of like, what did I, what have I done with my life? You know, probably has is dealing with some of the, the repercussions for being in the army and such. And he ends up studying aggregators um, as one of his McKinsey projects. And suddenly he connects it with the uh, growing legal marijuana industry. And now he's built this giant called Jane, which is a, 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 a valued at over a billion dollars uh, or more. And they have become the back office software, the Shopify for dispensary businesses. And it's just so interesting to talk to him about it because um, you know, he's, he really believes in empowering these small mom and pop retail stores and sees huge opportunity in it. And I just sent him the owner.com story. Um, and he, he, he loved it. He was like, more people should be thinking about this. Um, you know, we're moving away from the days of like, okay, Walmart just puts all these small businesses out, out of, out of, 
uh, the world? No, they're still sticking around. They're still surviving. How can we empower them? And it's a great business thesis for any startup. Totally. I also think like they're trying to be a lot of giants all at once. Because if you think about it, the challenge with being all in one is there's already multi-billion dollar companies just tackling one part of the value chain. And now you're wow. having to do it across three or four, right? So it's like, you know, they're, they're trying to compete against DoorDash and Uber. They're trying to compete against Shopify. They're trying to compete against like a HubSpot. Like it's, that's, that's kind of hard, right? Like in, if you think about it, it's like, Beating one is challenging enough. Try to beat three or four across like a bunch of different industries. Yes, but what makes it easier is a dedicated focus on the user, yeah, right? Totally. So you're niching down two restaurant owners and exactly what they need, right? Building the feature set that is going to make them the most successful. And yes, it's hard to execute on building the, all these steps in the technology, right? All these different things that owner.com offers. But the, the solace, the quantum of solace is in the fact that you can figure out exactly what this person wants because they run a very specific business. And that's kind of like what we've spoken about before, that the riches are in the niches, right? So um, this disintermediation trend, I feel like is finding its way into specific verticals. So like you have to build around a very specific user. And I mean, look at the domain, the owner.com. That could be bigger, man. That could be more than restaurants. Maybe that was part of it. It probably is. It probably is. Always I think a, always pick yeah. a domain name that never limits your business. <laughs> That's why he called it our future. It could be literally anything. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> no. Every industry that. domination. We're calling it X. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but what I will <laughs> say is like they've crossed that threshold where, you know, like in a fragmented industry, you essentially have to kind of take this grassroots approach. Maybe you're hitting up all the local restaurants, um, but they've built up some level of like credibility around this platform. And now 70% of their demand is inbound, right? That's one way to to tackle a uh, fragmented industry is just have them come to you. Yeah, it's like, hey, um, Don, hey Donnie, hey Donnie, yeah. have you heard of this thing, owner.com? It's awesome. <laughs> he buys through owner.com. He's like, you yeah. know, they talk to each other. These people talk to each other. I feel like um, you see these software businesses spending crazy money on like billboards and like in San Francisco and running crazy digital marketing campaigns. And it's like, maybe that's because nobody is gives a shit about your product, isn't telling other people about it, right? When you're targeting these industries that has historically haven't had a lot of like magical products, right? The word of mouth train is going to kick in hard. Dude, that's so true. I literally had this kind of anecdotal example here where I was getting a haircut in Indy and, you know, I was at my barber shop and they're like, uh, they had just onboarded onto this new platform called uh, Booksy. And they were just like so happy to tell me about Booksy, right? Because I think it felt like they had some edge, right? Like, or they were really at the forefront of this trend. They're like, yeah, we've been using Booksy. It processes all of our payments. And yeah. um, he was super excited to tell me about it. And I was like, a normal tech person wouldn't give a shit. It's just no. like another software that they're using. So Speaking I think of you're right. Shop, it, yeah. there, there's, these yeah. two, there's these two guys. I've covered them on our future before. Squire. And they, Squire, yeah. Yeah, Squire, yeah. Squire built a, a $700 million business like doing software for barbershops yeah That's yeah i mean it's it, it, same thing right fragmented industry tons of barbershops everywhere mom and pop um yeah you do have a few big national chains but um yeah i i thought it was a cool platform i think booksy actually has coverage across a ton of different categories so it's not yeah. just barbershops but yeah, yeah. You know, think of anything from A to Z. Um, one other thing that I thought was interesting as it relates to this story is the value in curation. Here's the challenge that I see with this business, which is I totally understand the aspect of trying to help them with SEO and trying to grow their online presence. But it comes back to a val like uh, it it comes back to a question of intent when you're searching out food um, and. I will talk about my own personal habits when it comes to just how I consume food at this point, which is it's just easier for me to go to a DoorDash or an Uber Eats and see all of my options in one place and make a decision from there, right? Like Absolutely. I don't really go out of my way to search up new local restaurants in the area. Um, I just kind of see who point. is already on the platform and I just That's pick one, see something on their menu and I run with it. Um, exactly. So, I, I don't, I'm yeah. not going to a specific restaurant's website to do an order with them. And that's what owner.com yeah. is. It's bringing the orders through their website. 
right. it's all, it's like changing your browser from Google to like Bing. You know what I mean? It's like, no, the, this totally. is the operate DoorDash and Uber Eats are the de facto operating system for food and the search engine. Right. And I think you and I both know, and for many other people, like they don't, we don't always have intentionality with our food choices. In fact, I would, I would argue that, uh, it's much more high level thinking of a bunch of different food spots in the moment versus I know exactly where I want to order. I've been to this place before and I'm going to go and pick up my order from them. Yeah. It's like, I probably, if you think about like this paradigm in general, right. It's, or just like consumer habits. It's like, I want Italian food. Um, and that's probably the, as far as I go, I never say like, I want Italian food from John and Sally's restaurant in town. Right. Maybe you're like that, but I would say that's probably few and far between like that isn't the usual case. Right. Right. Um, I think there is something to be said for loyalty though. Like if there are a few chains that you frequent, it probably does make sense to go through owner probably as the consumer and the restaurant and that you're paying less fees. Um, and like, there's probably potential to build up like a loyalty program of some sorts. I think that's always been a missed opportunity in the restaurant space. Um, why is there no good loyalty programs at the places that we go the most? Um, so I think that could be a big, big advantage, but yeah, I think for now it's, it's really focusing on that relationship that these restaurants have with people who really love their food in the local neighborhood and want to support them. But like, I guess there is an angle. It's kind of like charity. It's like, I'm going through your site when I use DoorDash and Uber Eats for everything. Yeah. You know, that brings up an interesting point, which is like loyalty for now has only been accessed through credit cards when it comes to restaurants. And even then it's just big chains, right? Like it's like, you get a $50 whatever oh, okay. through yeah. like your American Express or whatever uh, for like frequenting their restaurants. You haven't really seen that uh, taken place. And mom and pops. Yeah. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it. There should it. be better technology for it. I know the guy, I listened to a podcast with the guy who built Resi and he's now working on something. I think it's called like Blackbird. In this space. Or, or, yeah. Bird, and it's specifically for building up loyalty in mom and pop restaurants, right? Because they just That's don't cool. have anything for it, right? They don't recognize, like they may not recognize you again. Like all those different touches and stuff make you so much more likely to like enjoy your experience. So I don't know. I think it could be a big category. Maybe it's worth people looking into, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I think this is a really cool story. Young founder, perfect fair for, for the show, uh, building, you know, a business that could be valued in the billions of dollars. Uh, Toast is an $11 billion company. They're, they did the point of sale, the top, top to pay. Um, but, but yeah, it's, a, it's well, a so that's the interesting thing. Point of sale is the only thing that they're not making. They actually help you integrate with the existing platforms like square. Right. Um, and that makes sense. And I thought that was interesting. It's expensive to build that hardware and distribute that hardware across every restaurant. But wouldn't you argue that's a very valuable part in the, in the entire chain? Yeah. But like you, you owning the POS process. Toast was founded in 2012 square now called block also founded around the same time, their penetration and their products pretty good. I think both the products are pretty good building hardware for actual payment processing, I think is a probably a space that owner doesn't want to play in. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. It's probably like, you know, if it's a red ocean, let's just focus on the that other aspects ocean, that are. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And let's just focus on the areas that people aren't paying as much attention and just put all of our yeah. efforts there. I guess Absolutely. they could always come back to trying to build a POS system once they have like a massive network of restaurants that um, are exclusively using their platform for like 95% mm -hmm. of the work they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's what Jane does. Jane Tech, the Socrates guy, they do point of sale. And, and that's mainly yeah. because of the financial issues and some of the marijuana business. Um, totally. But yeah, they're truly building the Amazon Shopify and, you know, they're building their own uh, in-app ad network now for these various products. And it's interesting, man. Uh, every industry has its opportunities for yes. verticalized software. Hit us with our uh, trailblazers also trying to take down DoorDash yeah. over so, in the world of last mile logistics. Yeah. So for the guys also trying to disrupt DoorDash and blow it up, um, we have these guys based out of Oklahoma. I think they were in Austin for a little bit. Now they're in Oklahoma. I think they're still in Austin. Okay. Yeah. Their LinkedIn said yeah. the company was in Oklahoma. So so Garrett McCurrock and his co-founders, Michael Malikian, Cannon Reeves, and Drew Belcock, they are building a last mile delivery company called Pipe Dream Labs. So uh, the stat in the industry is that 40% of logistics expenses come from the last mile. And that's because you have a super inefficient process. You need a human being to go carry the burrito from DoorDash a mile away <laughs> to the apartment complex 
and then go navigate that apartment complex, right? Try and get in in the first place, then go up the elevator, find your apartment, or it's just kind of a, you get lost in communication. It's very inefficient, not only because you have to pay someone to do it, but they only have one payload. So with what Pipe Dreams is doing is they're resorting to a method of transport that we've been relying on for hundreds of years, which is pipes, right? We use pipes for our sewer. We use pipes for our water. We use pipes for our Wi-Fi with fiber optics, but we're not using it for delivery. And it's a really interesting idea because uh, it's not as disruptive as you'd think. When, when you think about autonomous vehicles, imagine all the variables and all the human safety risks that are involved with turning those vehicles into logistics products. When you look at pipes, they're contained. They don't necessarily run by people. Um, for example, with pipe dreams to pipes, they're, they're not pressurized. They're just a robot on rails that's going through the pipe and delivering the product from where it was deposited to a central uh, location where people can all grab it from. So for example, uh, the pipe dream network would route into an office park, right? And there would be one central hub, maybe on each floor, for where you can grab your order instead of having to go down and pick it up or have the person come up. So it's very efficient in that way. Um, but yeah, they've raised $11 million so far. Um, you know, these are guys with a huge vision. Reminds me of like Elon Musk's Hyperloop or Boring Company type thing, but uh, yeah. an underground lunch train as Bloomberg calls it. So fascinating <laughs> idea. Um, there's so much value for consumers in faster delivery. I think there's some jokes around silicon and Valley. cheaper and cheaper cheaper delivery. because there's no human involved which is super cool yes. and the the technology isn't as expensive as you'd think it's just pipes and robots so like i think there's been some jokes in silicon valley like why are the world's smartest people focused on helping you get a delivery of a burrito two minutes faster yeah. um but i don't know man this is really really cool i think this is a, a new kind of delivery network that could make uh cities way better uh, and reduce yeah. emissions and congestion on the roads. I mean, what they're really working towards is hyperlogistics. And for those of you that don't know what hyperlogistics is, it's just essentially this premise, which is um, if you're in a city and there is something that you're trying to access, which is also in the city, how do you access it or get it delivered to, say, your office or your home in cities or minutes? Right. So this goes even beyond food. And I think what's really interesting about this is that. I don't know if they intended to go underground first. I actually think they were trying to use drones, right? Because this is uh -huh. a this is this is a, a problem focused around uh, time and a problem focused around cost, right? So yeah. underground just ended up being that wedge opportunity for them, which was like, hey, this may be the easiest way to approach this problem, um, just be given given the congestion in the streets and the air and yeah. all that stuff. Um, but what I think was really interesting is they are actually using the same kind of pipes that you would use for like utilities uh, underground. And so I think that's really smart of them because if there was something wrong with the pipes, what uh, like a, a huge problem that would be to deal with. Right. But instead, if something breaks, it's going to be the robot that's operating inside the pipes. Yes. Right. And so um, but way easier to deal with. And I thought it was a very strategic approach. And I think the way they essentially approached this was with a few questions or a few operating kind of thesis uh, theses here, right? Which was, um, if you're going to build underground, you need to scale as fast as possible. And for that to happen, the infrastructure has to be very cheap. Second, you have to make sure it can't break. Because if it breaks to the point I was just making, it's going to be a bitch to try to replace it. And third, you have to install it with as much current regulation as possible, right? If this was a business where you're depending on, um, you know, policy or regulation to change in the coming years for it to be sustainable or for you to actually operate, you wouldn't be able to do it. And so those were kind of the three things that they had to navigate with this company. Dude, I love businesses that are hyper futuristic like this one, yet depend yeah. on, uh, technological infrastructure we've been relying on, like I said, for hundreds of years. Uh, what you just said about they're using the same pipes that other utilities use and other construction use cases is awesome because the interoper interoperability is wild. You can have any plumber come and like fix the pipe that they've installed in a city and and maintain this network, right? So it's not like the boring company where you need your, they need their own specialized hardware and these crazy totally. like permits to blow all these holes underground, build like, you know, transport humans. And they're not transporting humans. Right. 
Like, I just feel like there's so many things about this that make perfect sense and that you don't involve like humans at all in the process to, for one, to pay them or to harm them, which I think is the big challenge with any, any business that moves shit around air taxis, drones, autonomous vehicles, those, those industries are going to be mired in regulatory mud for so fucking long. And they're only going to kill more people. Right. And it's going to slow it down again. So the fact that they're kind of avoiding all that and are building this, this tunnel based delivery network is crazy. I mean, could you imagine a future where we all have a little portal in our house and it just pops open and you get your DoorDash like right by your kitchen counter? Like that's Dude, crazy. Dude, it'd be super cool. Yeah, wow. that'd be insane. Yeah. yeah. And especially as we, you know, city people move to the cities more and, you know, population gets more concentrated and kind of just have these central kind of collection units where we get all of our shit from and we don't have to worry. Yeah. Like, Dude, I just think it's such a waste of human potential for people to carry around burritos in their car. <laughs> like homie got his car stolen from our place in Austin because he had to pop out and deliver your burrito to our door when it was like 10 feet, you know? <laughs> yeah. He got his shit jacked outside of our yeah. house. <laughs> it was this prevents insane. He should, yeah. he should hire this guy as like a testimonial. Like this is the future. I got my car stolen as a poor driver. I mean, totally. It sounds like they're also trying to put DoorDash out of business. Yeah. If uh, if Pipe Dream gets it right, there may not be a DoorDash or an Uber Eats. Or because they'll have their own. App. They will look very different. Yeah, one hundred percent. They'll have their own. App. Um, you know what's interesting about this is that just kind of as it comes to the installation process, right? So these are twelve inch. Uh, these are twelve inch PVC pipes, and the good thing is, is that any city they go to. The, you know, there's going to be five or six construction companies that already are doing this kind of work, right? And so finding the supply of contractors that you can find to actually install this for you already exists. That's yep. huge value add. And that's kind of the point that you're making with Elon. Yeah. And I think what else is interesting about them is the permitting process, right? So the first city that they piloted in, it was only two days. It was two days of going through the BS and they were able to get approved they agreed to a franchise fee where they're paying per mile. And so that is the metric that they're using from a cost basis. And I always think this is kind of an interesting way to break down the business is like, what are their unit economics here? And what do people think about when they think about investing? Yeah. Um, the per mile thing, that franchise fee, they're sharing it with the city, which I think is great. Um, That's if you great. think about these services like Uber and DoorDash, they're actually harming the city. Why? Just like our buddy Ritwick building that company Vade, which monitored curb space, right? These yeah. delivery companies cause so much congestion and problems in temporary parking setups and throwing their scooter on the street or like whatever it is, right? The fact that they're working in conjunction with the city, I think is big. And we're seeing all these autonomous vehicle companies, they need to work with the city. They can't get away with the Silicon Valley mentality of let's fuck shit up and then ask for permission. Like it needs to be from the ground up working with cities to build a better community. and. Yeah, I mean, what I think is funny is they found the perfect city to test this in. So the town is called Peachtree Corners, and it's a, a small suburb in Atlanta with a quirky mayor who's obsessed with innovation. So this guy has claimed that his city has been the hub for three technological innovations, including fiber optic <laughs> Wi-Fi and the first company to operate remote e-scooters. And now he's taking a chance on the boys at Pipe Dream. So I think it's quirky and fun that they found this guy yeah, who's, yeah, who, that's who awesome. wants to let this thing rip. Um, <laughs> and another thing I'd note is that if you're building a deep tech company, what it appears to me is the move is to go to the American South uh, because th this is an area of the country that has typically been like ignored from a tech standpoint. And it also has like, I feel like more receptive lawmakers and such to these kinds of experiments and projects because they're looking to like innovate as more people move to the South. Like it's a booming region. Um, so yeah, if you're building deep tech, you know, like I feel like Austin, Atlanta, Miami, like these, these Southern Sunbelt cities are a great place to be. Yeah, dude, I think that's really interesting. I actually had no clue. Uh, pretty unique insight there. What I will also say that's interesting about them is they face a network place problem, um, which is you want to create the least amount of pipe to get the most value possible, right? And so um, 
inherently more pipe they create, it should make the entire network more valuable, right? There's more places that they can deliver to. Um, and so I just, I don't know why in my head I'm thinking about this like Legos almost. It's just like yeah. <laughs> they're just building out Legos and um, they're just like one little like piece that just keeps getting added and added and added and they get more coverage. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Another thing that I, is kind of a challenge for them is the navigation issue, right? So I don't know how strong navigation is underground. And I think like actually tracking the robots is very hard to do um, within like which part of the pipe they are in. So I don't know yeah. how they're going to solve that. Yeah, well, I don't I don't know if that's a big issue because uh, it's only going to be it's going to be relatively shallow. It is a big issue, though, right now. He has he is like publicly stated it is really? an issue. Yeah. yeah, like tracking these robots underground. I mean, I can hardly track my DoorDash driver. He's going the wrong way all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so little, true. little robotic hands. <laughs> bro i yeah I, I think logistics founders are like the craziest like i just think that they have like a certain aura about them that just screams like change the world i remember interviewing this one guy um and he's now built a multi-billion dollar company called adabotics and what he did was build a supply chain company modeled off of ant colonies and i was like bro that's just like a crazy connection to make that is they wild. Built this company based on how ants like in nature move supplies around and organize things. So I don't know. They've always got a quirky story like that and how they came up with their idea and like why they're yeah. changing the entire paradigm. But man, there's been a lot of money thrown at this delivery space, man. There's another company. Do you remember the Duffel guys? They were doing 10 minute scooter deliveries. I think they're still in mm -hmm. business, college campus focused. But at the end of the day, you still got to pay the kids and find the kids who are willing to go and deliver gummies at like 1 a.m., you know? Yeah, I think cost is kind of the primary thing that everyone is focusing on right now in the delivery right. space. Um, and then I think, you know, underneath that, the second biggest priority is time. So if you look at the current uh, paradigm for the time scale, right, the maximum speed for delivery through these pipes is 120 miles per hour. I think right now they're around the 30 to 40 mile per hour mark. Um, and that actually is kind of at bar with the efficiency speed they're trying to get. Because if you think about it, like food delivery right now is anywhere between 30 to 30 minutes to an hour time scale. And e-com is one to two day time scale, right? And so at least if you can get on par, you know that this is, or if you can get to parity, this is like, position to do really well because anything faster is just cherry on the top um and so i Bro, think that is just kind of a unique way to do this consumers are never going to be happy unless they can literally teleport a burrito in front of them like, <laughs> instantly like yeah you know americans, button, have, boom. americans have zero yeah. patience bro no wonder silicon valley's <laughs> been funding all of these autonomous delivery companies like Dude, I, it was so annoying. Like I'd walk around Silicon Valley at like shopping malls and on the downtown streets and there'd just be like a little robot like scurrying along with like a pizza inside and there'd be a motherfucker yeah. on, riding its bike behind like watching this little boy like try and navigate the streets. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's just like dumb as hell, bro. Like fuck that. Don't go surface level. Go down, man. Go down. <laughs> You know, maybe we'll see an owner.com and Pipe Dream Labs collab someday. It's like I'm ordering my Italian food from <laughs> Sally's here in town. And then I open up this little pipe thing from Pipe Dream and boom, there it is. Oh, man. Who Bro. needs to pay $7 in delivery fees? I'm paying nothing at all. It's just going to get to me for free. <laughs> Bro, just wait until I climb into the pipe and go all the way back to the restaurant. <laughs> I don't want to wait. <laughs> Dude, I'd be getting stuck in the pipe. They're going to have to set... <laughs> They're going to have to send the whole out. team down to get me. <laughs> blue, collar, blue collar service in the making. <laughs> They're going to have to... Extracting They're... hungry men oh from gosh. pipes. Yeah, they're going to have to stop the entire pipe system because of me. I'm just going to be stuck like right in the middle. It's like half into the pipe and my legs are going to be coming out the other half. Oh, my gosh. Dude, I'm going to hop in that pipe. I'm going to hop in that pipe. Go. <laughs> so funny. All right. Well, I guess on that note, let's go ahead and wrap. Thank you all for listening to another episode of Our Future Podcast. As always, we love doing this. Give us your feedback on Twitter, on Instagram, on email, whatever is easiest for you. 
subscribe and give us a rating wherever you listen to this. And we will catch you again next week on another episode of Our Future Podcast. Stay frosty. Stay frosty, everybody. Peace.